All right, you're good to go. Okay, seeing the presence of a quorum, uh, I'm going to uh, call the four, April 26, 2023 meeting of the Governance Organization Legislation Committee to order. And pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 and 107 of the Acts of 22, 2022, <laughs> and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted by a remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately ac access the proceedings in real time via technological means. So uh, I'm going to do roll call. Lynn Griesmer. Present. Uh, I'm present. Mandy Jo. Present. And Jennifer Taub. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to sort of pop into looking at both the flag policy and the public dialogue. Uh, I know Lauren was saying on the public dialogue not to rush, but there were a couple of things I thought would be worth talking about. Uh, but I was wondering if we could start with the flag policy. Um, and what I'm thinking is that, um, where is it? On uh, we, I'm going back to Andy's uh, concern that um, this would the Tibetan flag be allowed? And I don't think we had a direct answer from uh, Lauren, but when rereading section, um, where is it? Let me see. Of the definition section three, I believe it is. It says on uh, f uh, number five under section th uh, three one. Um, uh, flags displayed in conjunction with official ceremonial positions of the town council when accompanied by an official action such as a formal vote proclamation or resolution of the town council. I miss, that sounds to me like anything that we vote on in terms of a resolution or a proclamation would, would uh, fit that flying the Tibetan flag is in commemoration of a national uprising uh, in that country. So I'm not sure, but so I'd like to hear input from you folks. And because if we can get this out of here, um, we can start really getting uh, it refined and regulations made. And the other question I had is, should we be adding, should this be, uh, a, have a section on banners? or are we just leaving that with the town manager? Which, I mean, he would be doing it anyway, but whether we need to put it in the policy. So any thoughts, Mandy? Yeah, um, a couple of thoughts as I've reread this a couple of times. Um, I, I agree with you on what you just said. I think number five, you know, I, I think something like the Tibetan flag does not fall under anything other than number five, yeah. but I don't think number, you know, I don't think the fact that it is excluded under say number one, that that doesn't mean we could include it under number five. You know, I, I don't read it like, oh, since it's not an official flag of a government, we can't do it under number five. Um, so I think it, I think it counts and I think it would, would, I think the town council would be able to continue its typical practice given the proclamations. Um, the question I have is how number one, a new one, and then another question and number, Good. how number one relates to number two, we added, you know, um, in number two, the resolution proclamation commemoration or citation number one only required that for the, well, so so number one defines what a commemorative flag is with those five items. Number two says you could fly it at the request of a member of the town council. Um, if you 
ignore what we added last time, which I asked us to add. It meant that only number five, the array it was originally written, only number five, those displayed in conjunction with official ceremonial positions would require the proclamation resolution type thing. Numbers one, two, three, and four would not. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think in some sense, all of them probably should, right? <laughs> um, um, potentially, even if it's just something short. Um, and so I'm curious whether we could delete from number five of section 3.1, you know, flag, you know, whether that one could just read flags displayed in conjunction with an official, with official ceremonial positions of the town council, period. Because number two requires everything, um, to have a resolution, proclamation, commemoration, or citation. That's true. So, or do we just not want to mess with it? Is the other question maybe not messing with it while keeping the additional thing in number two in there is. Mm -hmm. And then I, I have to review it. Um, but number one says that the town council is authorized to display a commemorative flag to fly at town owned or town maintained properties. Oh, and so that, I have yeah. to go back to, and so I'm not sure to answer your next question about banners. Um, I almost think that this, and I have to read it more closely. Uh, I almost think that this policy covers, requires town council action for all commemorative flag at all town-owned properties unless we can find where it designates something else. Mm -hmm. And so I'll read it closely, but I'm not sure we need a banner section because I think this one might cover it. And then I had actually gone back to the public ways policy, yeah. whatever it is, given our our designation of the town manager, what we've fobbed off to the town manager almost. <laughs> that doesn't actually include banners at all. Um, from what I could see. So if we wanted to give that authority to the manager, I think we need to modify uh, that 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 policy, whatever it's called. Okay. Lynn, and, now, and then I'm sorry, Mandy, were you finished? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Good points, by the way. Uh, Lynn? Uh, I do agree with Mandy that we need to modify the um, public way policy to include banners so that the town manager does that legitimately, legitimately under that. When it's when I read number three one, okay, it can sat it doesn't have to satisfy all five of these. No. So then I'm going to raise my question: If somebody came to us and said. I want to fly the flag of Russia. What do they have to do? Get a community uh, council sponsor, and then it would need to be voted on in the council, and the council could deny the request or not. Okay. It says may authorize the display of commemorative flags. So, uh, and I think that was one of the things that Lauren talked about the most. Um, Jennifer, do you want to address that? Because I saw you nodding. Well, I just had a question because I think Lynn raises a great question. Um, so what would be different about that than the flag that, you know, the court case was about in Boston? I'm just being devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. um, so it has to be approved by the council, but does the council have to have some objective criteria? You know, so if let's say they came to a council member in Boston when they asked to fly that flag, and the council said no, voted no, could they then bring a case that it was because of the content? I think because of the way Boston was just flying anything and had no process whatsoever about flag flying is why they, why the Christian group won the case because they were one of the only flags denied. Right. Um, so, so if we vote it down, we don't have to give a, okay. I mean, I just wanted to make sure we're, yeah, no, I think you're, I'm going to go to Mandy and, and Lynn, these are good questions. So, so uh, let me just add to my yeah. one question, and that is, are we sending this off for legal review, I hope? It already had it. 
Lauren had this in her possession when she came to us two weeks ago. As far as I know. That's, yeah, she did have it in her possession and was asked to look at it as well as the public dialogue stuff. Okay, um, Mandy, what do you think legally? Yeah. So, so what I was gonna say is based on the memo and um, what Lauren said last week, the reason this one, this policy is being, we're being asked to adopt it, um, at, if you go back up to the purpose, in mm -hmm. adopting this policy, the town council declares that these flagpoles owned and maintained by the town of Amherst are not intended to and do not serve as a forum for free expression by the public, but rather as a non-public forum for the display of governmental and non-governmental flags um, um, as an expression of the council's official governmental speech and policy sentiments. And mm -hmm. that's the that's the key. In Boston, there was that the court determined that since Boston had no policy and never had to say anything, that flagpole was not governmental speech and therefore stopping some, um, so it was a, a public forum basically. So think about the Southbridge case. We also talked about the court in the Boston case for flags basically said that flagpole is the equivalent of a public comment period and you can't stop people from saying things that you don't like on it because Boston did because and they ruled it because Boston had always allowed flags to be displayed generally without regard to anything and without official government action. Boston lost the argument that the flagpoles were official governmental speech. Right. And so this policy deems them official governmental speech. And once they're deemed that and we do all of this, then you you are allowed to basically say if it's governmental speech, you can regulate it. It's only if it's that full public forum that you can't do content-based regulation. And, yeah, and that seems to be my understanding as well. Um, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, thanks, thank you. So going back up to the purpose, to answer my own question, this one talks about um, the purpose is to adopt a policy about permanent flagpoles on the town common only. Right, not banners at all. Not banners. Yeah. And so we, you know, and, and so in that sense, it does only cover those flagpoles. We should probably encourage Paul to adopt a similar policy regarding banners as executive speech or something. Um, although I don't know, right? There's still public way. If I guess we need, we need to designate him as the person to decide those banners. And then he gets to adopt it as governmental speech if he wants to, or if not, then he opens himself up to that, mm -hmm. I would say. Okay, so Lynn, does that does this discussion so far answer your concerns? It does. Yeah, and are there any other changes that anyone sees or has been thinking about that we need to look at now? Michelle? I just, I had a question about Mandy's last comment. Um, so Paul, as the chief executive of, of the executive branch, is he able to adopt something as governmental speech? So those banners are on the public way. Yeah. Technically, we are the keepers of the public way and we have to authorize them. Um, we've generally just handed that authority to control the public way to him, although I looked at the public ways sort of that that Bob, I call it the fob off policy. I don't know what the title is. Um, <laughs> the one where we said, Paul, these are yours. We don't want to see them at a council meeting. Um, right. um we've handed a bunch of stuff off to him. It's not clear whether banners are part of that. And so one thing we should do is make clear that those, those banners are part of that handing off the jurisdiction to him. And I think if we've handed off the jurisdiction 
and then make sure we include his ability to adopt regulations, particularly with respect to banners, then yes. um, he would be able to adopt a similar policy related to banners. And so then technically, I would assume it becomes the speech of, I mean, whether it's the executive or the legislative through the executive, because we've handed him that authority. I don't know, but we'd just have to hand him that authority, I believe, and then we'd be okay. And I remember Paul saying that the bid or the chamber or both have been involved in um, decisions about the banners, you know, what goes up there. My concern, and you know, is can someone put up anti uh, uh, an anti-Semitic parade is going to happen in uh, Malden, Massachusetts, everybody's, you know, is there speech that we would not want to see on a banner? And if that if that does not reflect the majority values of the community, that's that's where my concern is. Uh, uh, if, if a Christian church wanted to put up a banner about Easter week or something like that, I don't think that would bother me. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm concerned a little bit. Uh, so, uh, and if no one else has that concern, we can... That's fine. Um, but um, Mandy, could, and you can say no, would you be willing to draw up something to um, go to Paul? Um, what do you mean? A, about, a new about policy, him. a new yeah. addition to that policy where we've handed yeah. stuff off? Yeah, I, I'm happy to do that. When in looking at it, I realized it needs some other changes too. So um, it still talks about our temporary zoning um, related to the pocket outdoor dining. It still talks about the temporary zoning that's no longer in effect and the um, outdoor dining regs from the state that are still emergency regs that were extended for two more years, but we right. might want to clean that up. Okay, maybe so that should come back it. before we do anything about engaging Paul. We should bring that to the next meeting. That's fine. I would request Athena. I think I don't. I don't think I have an updated word copy of that policy. Instead, it's just the. I can just download the PDF. So it would be nice to be able to get a word copy of it. Yeah, I'll get that to you. Thank you. Thank you. Could you send me a copy as well, Athena? You got it. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle, and then Lynn. Yeah, just following up to that. Um, I think it would. It would. I think it would be important to check in with our, our town attorney on this because if in terms of how to how to go about it, because if we essentially are the government speech as a legislative body, and then we say that we're handing banners over to, to Paul, not that I don't fully trust Paul's, uh, you know, judgment, but how sort of who's if something gets put on a banner through Paul um, somehow for however, and many reasons that could happen, that is something that proves to be offensive or, or does not reflect our government speech, um, then who, you know, who, who's responsible for that? How does that get, I, I don't know. It just, it, I know we do this with other things as well, like say, through the legislative body to Paul, but I mean, at the end of the day, is it that we are still responsible for what is on those banners? Mm, good question. Uh, and Mandy, are you going to uh, an answering that, or otherwise, I'm going to jump to Lynn. I, I was just going to say, I think I'll take notes, and I think we might be able to do something like this. One has a definition of commemorative flags, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we might be able to say, hey, Paul, if it fits within these four categories, we don't need to see it. If they're, they're likenesses of U.S. flags or, you know, um, so U.S. flags, I'm, I'm not sure I do other nations, but, you know, modify some of these, include things like welcome back students banners or banners of the three universities, things that we've seen where we can say, you know, they can go up, but if it's X, Y, or Z, it, you can't approve that banner. We're keeping that, that 
thing. And so we might have to modify this flag policy, but I think we can maybe do that delineation, Michelle. Um, that would that would be great. Yeah, that would be really good, I think. All right, I'm gonna go to Lynn. My comment is more that I would rather that we hold this until we also deal with the public ways policy and bring them both forward at the same time. And uh, just to note that our next council meeting, well, our next council meeting is on Monday. This is not going on that agenda. No, it's not. Uh, I didn't intend it to. The next one after that is the 15th. And then one after that is not until June 3rd. So it's possible that we could deal with both of these between now and June 3rd and have them come up on the June 3rd agenda. Okay. That makes some sense. Anybody in disagreement with that? Okay, great. Um, any other questions directly now on flag or banner policy? Okay, so I so I think it's clear that uh, that we're going to hold off on that. So I think we're ready to move to public dialogue. And I put a few things in the packet. Um, I think they were in there before, but. Uh, just some um, public speak in Natick and um, uh, invocation in the beginning. I, it's still unclear to me how fast we need to move on this, uh, but since um, I'm interested in seeing what we can do, and also I'm starting to hear some confusion that people think we're trying to affect public comment. And what we're, yes, we are in the sense that we're acknowledging uh, freedom of speech issues and and civility don't necessarily uh, coincide. Lynn? Yeah, I just wanna mention some of other people may have been um, at the MMA seminar yesterday. Uh, we didn't see the audience, but um, it, it, Lauren actually was one of the two panelists. It was on um, open meeting law and public records, but this issue came up and what she and the attorney are consistent, and the other attorney are consistently saying is, this issue is going to continue to remain unclear and tested over a period of time. And maybe she said that to this committee last week. I was yeah, unable to. Yeah, she did. Yeah, so whatever we do, whether we're in a hurry or not, um, I think we need to realize that whatever we do is probably gonna have to come back to be modified over time. So that's all. Yeah. No, I agree with that. I'm just sort of trying to figure out whether um, we need to really look in terms of our, our rules and procedures and remove the word civility. Um, and it, it's hard to know because we're, you know, respectful, um, all speakers are encouraged to present this. This is public speak in Natick, uh, their remarks in a respectful manner. And again, respectful um, is open to interpretation as is civility. So I'm, I'm not sure where to go with this. Jennifer? You know, I was just gonna ask, so like the Natick policy that predates this court case. Yeah, uh, right. I don't know. I don't know. I wonder if that's- I so I can answer that. Um, it predates Southboro, but it is when the ACLU sued Natick School Committee, and this policy, when that that lawsuit never went to trial, never they they mediated it and reached a settlement. And part of that settlement was the ACLU agreeing that this Natick policy met their criteria. Oh, okay. So. Um, right. So it, it predated still, it, Southboro, but the ACLU sort of said, this is good. <laughs> uh, could it be challenged now, do you think? Or we, that's what we don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe not, but, but you know, it was brought to my attention that the ACLU had sort of put their stamp, yeah, of, approval. stamp of approval on this one by agreeing to settle if Natick adopted, Natick School Committee adopted that policy, um, you know, my guess is, you know, and so, so who knows if Southboro would change that, right? But at least it had some sort of ACLU okay 
to right. it. That's their ex mm -hmm. freedom of speech is their yeah expertise. So one uh, so one of the things uh, was also included was a Vermont invocation. I'm really not too supportive of that. If we're going to invoke anything at the beginning of a meeting, I'd like to see it reference the land grabbing <laughs> that we've done in this country um, and in, and the uh, taking over indigenous lands. But do we want to look at um, our policy? Do we want and see where we might uh, make any adjustments that to, to coincide with Natick? So I think it would be useful to go through rule six. Yeah. Um, that's the one you had on here. Rule five is a different yes, part, right? Like rule five and rule six are kind of a combination, you know, Natick's policy is kind of a combination of the two, but rule six is our code of conduct. Um, and so it might be worth us pulling it up, looking at it. I know there were a couple of proposed changes by myself and I think Michelle way back when we sent them all in. Um, um, you know, there's there's a bunch in this. It's got sections on public. It's got sections on counselor. We might be able to to get through some things and at least be able to look at some of it because I think Lauren said last time when I asked her that Southboro really applies to the public comment section, not right. the sort of non-public part of the meeting. So we might not. You know, I think that's section six one and six two more than anything else three four and potentially five right and so might be worth just looking at it and talking through them along with the changes that michelle and i and maybe others proposed and <laughs> see do we have the uh that one doesn't have the proposed changes yeah. in it it was in the packet under other rule changes. I have it as a PDF, but it might be a. <laughs> oh, it's also the it, it's also the word document in the packet. Other rule changes, comments, and discussions three fifteen. Yeah. If Athena wants me to put it up, I could. I'm that would be easier. Okay. Too many versions of. All right. Thank you, Athena. Yeah, so right away uh, in 6.1b, discourse accounting shall be marked by civility, openness, and respect, even in the face of disagreement. Now, this is counselor behavior. Can we call on counselors to be civil? Well, I think so, we can. Isn't that outside of the public? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's outside. I was wondering if, you know, we have like a 6.1, a 6.2, and a 6.3, right? Mm -hmm. One's public civility and engagement, one is general rules and one is counselor rules. I wonder if it would just be clearer if we had, if 6-1 sort of folded into 6-3, hmm. you know, into counselor and invited guests or presenters or you know, the not, or, or clarified that 6-1 is the non-public comment portion, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, I think we can require during the uh, meeting participants, not during the public comment period to be civil or respectful or whatever words we use. That's, let me look, I need to look at a different set. 
you know, maybe rule six needs to delete essentially most of 6.2 public civility and engagement and move that to rule five somehow or five point whatever public, public comment is the public. I, I don't know. I don't think so because rule six is about codes of conduct. And so we're talking uh, and rule five is really uh, talking about when public dialogue can happen. Um, and so what I'm thinking here, um, we have a couple of things that I believe are right in terms of there's something about we incur, uh, let me see where I can find it. I'm, uh, uh, there so was, would, it, oh, would it be that just, we have to just address 6.2, which is public? Civility. I mean, if we clarify that 6.1 is for meeting participants, like what- Yeah, because right now it says all meeting participants. Right. right. Michelle? Yeah, I think that um, given what we're dealing with with the public piece of things, I do think that that should be, I think it's confusing the way that it's reading right now. And I think we should keep what is a matter between counselors separate from what the expectations are for the public. And Pat, I just wanted to ask you, so you didn't feel comfortable moving the civility portion for the public up into um, number five, is that is that what you said? Yeah, uh, it seems to me, let me let me go back to five here, 5.3. Uh, 5.3 is a type of meeting, Pat. Wait, I can't, I didn't understand that. 5.3 is a type of meeting. I think we're right. really it's dealing with 5.1 which yeah. is the public comment section of regular meetings. Content, uh, length yeah. of, uh, number of public comments per person, uh, recognition. It seems like 6.2 is basically all, that a lot of it has to go away. Yeah, because well, I don't know if it has to go away, but it needs to be clar certainly clarified. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because exactly. I feel like recognition, you know, who regular meetings, there's nothing in there about how you have to be nice. Um, so right. that would, we'd split that up, right? I don't <clears throat> see the point of splitting it up. What, what are you, No, I our rules currently split up that portion of sort of the being nice out of public comment and say the public has to be nice at all times, which would apply to public comment. And so- Well, we're supposed to be nice all the time too, but we don't yeah. do it. <laughs> I still feel like six, five and six are really different. Um, you know, and six is the one that focuses on, on how counselors should behave with each other and with the public and what we're hoping the public will do when they engage with us. And so they feel very distinct to me. Um, I, I agree. Yeah, I agree that they're distinct. I just wonder if we should, um, for six, uh, just even move the order of six, one, two, and three as to make the public piece more clear um, and distinct from the counselor pieces. I, I, I don't think that's a big change, but um, it might just help to well, clarify things. It does feel like it's split because 6.2, the council, it starts, the uh, A, the council welcomes the public. Uh, maybe it should, um, to meetings and encourages public comments. And then it goes on about, and then 6.3 looks at counselor's conduct. Is 6.1, so is when we say all participants of a meeting, if we're in a space together uh, in the town room and there are folks from the public there, are they considered participants of the meeting? Because I think during the public are. comment part, they might be. Mm -hmm. And only during that 
Is that because then we're really open here on 6.1, basically. Yeah, yeah. You know. The council yeah. tries an atmosphere. Um, I'm wondering what is professional conduct? And, and we this is a place where we can use what the SJC said. We can be saying the council requires an atmosphere of uh, res respect and what was the respectful. Oh, I'm blanking. I hate this. Peaceable. Peaceable. Peaceable and respectful. <laughs> right. So, so instead of professional conduct and um, civility, but peaceful and respectful um, conduct among all but meeting participants. Respectful is not a requirement under South Right. Carolina. We can't peaceable, use that word. Peaceable might be, but not respectful exactly. Peaceable. Right. There was peace. I thought there were two things in that decision. Peaceable in time, place, and manner. Ah, yes, yes. Thank right. you. The time, place, and manner is rule five. In some sense, we're be. splitting up the time, place, and manner into rule one of the rule five things and the peaceable for public into yeah, rule yeah, Absolutely. So, Prisha, so the council requires an atmosphere of peaceable conduct among all meeting participants. Right. You cannot threaten someone with bodily harm. I mean, yeah, but and that's shall not this. tolerate harassment, discrimination, or offensive behavior. Um, you no, know, any, or should any, any of member us. of the council. And I was trying to exp uh, try to be clear that it's the council and me and and people in the. If you think about Zoom in the panelist section, so if we invite Paul to speak or Lauren to speak, they should also have to. <laughs> Um, yeah. not use um, oh, uh, insulting behavior or whatever. Um, but I think the first paragraph needs clarified. A lot of it does. I, I could try, I, I think it might be easier if we just go through some stuff, see what might need clarified, highlighted, and then have someone attempt to do it. Okay. Okay. Um, let's, well, let's certainly mark that as. And then we also probably need to look at Appendix A because the, we're guided by that uh, creative culture of grace, healthy balance, respect. It might, we might want to just stick with six for now. Yeah. And there's really, yeah. You know. Okay. So we, uh, we agree that we need to look at the very 6.1. Yeah. Is so there we did. Else? Go ahead. Jennifer? Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm actually looking also at the hard copy. So we took out, I, this is a question I have, like initially in the hard, you know, in our original rules of procedure, it says that residents shall confine their remarks to the substance of the issue at hand. But can we say they can only discuss the issue at hand? Is that still something we can, or can they say address any topic? So we can limit in gen, I mean, Lauren said this, it gets hard though, and you have to be consistent, right? You can, right. you can, Lauren said you can say public comment is only for items on the agenda during a meeting. You can say only items within the purview of the council. You can say everything. If you say only items on the agenda though, you have to be consistent with that because the minute you allow someone to speak not on the agenda, everyone let everybody not right. on, on yeah. the agenda. So and so we've taken that language out, <laughs> right? So I just want to ask. So we've taken that language out for, on six point one, which I think is good, right? Like what I'm seeing on the screen is much shorter than what's in the hard copy. You know, no, so A is A is currently part of the rules. Yeah, All meeting participants shall focus their remarks on the matter being discussed or voted on. Yeah, I'm not seeing where you're saying things were cut out, uh, Jennifer. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I guess I'm reading a printed copy that the last date is September 27th, 2021. So I must have an old copy of the rules of procedure. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Never mind. Never mind. That's all right. The, um, hmm. So I think A just needs modified to exclude public comment or add something about the public comment period. Right. Because A is basically yeah. trying to say 
if we're discussing the regional school budget, we can't add, we, we should not bring up comments about the um, gravity belt thickener to talk about Monday. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> is stick to whatever the topic is. Is there a difference though, because we have specific comment periods um, where, we, where we don't allow a divergence from what's on the, what we're, this, uh, what's on the agenda or we're looking at. Yeah. And the initial general public comment, it seems to me that's a period where residents can bring up issues that they're concerned about whether they're on the agenda or not. Right, so general I, public comment. Yeah, yeah. and so um, I sometimes I feel like I don't, you know, how do, the idea of uh, commenting on things that are in the purview of the council. And I've heard people say, well, school salary, you know, teacher salaries and stuff aren't the purview of the council, but there are aspects of it that are in the purview of the council when we look at the uh, regional and the school budget, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm hesitant to, um, I'm not sure, um, Jennifer? No, I, I agree with you. I don't, you know, I think we should be err on the side of being expansive and not restrictive. Yeah. In general, yeah. You know, that this is their one opportunity to, you know, general public comment is to say what's on their mind. Mm -hmm. So I think that goes um, 6.2B that says public comments shall focus yeah. on matters. I, you know, I think we need to to redefine some stuff or capitalize things so we know what we're talking about, right? Um, okay. But I think the question is then, do we want it to be within the jurisdiction of the council or like, is that the restriction this committee wants to, it's what we've operated under. Mm -hmm. Although that gets ahead of B, C, D, and E under right. 6.1. Yeah. <laughs> if we want to go on. No, I'm already jumping ahead beyond that. One yeah. <laughs> um, so I think 6.1B is problematic. Okay. This course it, account should be marked. I, yes, it is definitely problematic. Unless we exclude, I think as if we exclude from the public comment periods, you know, except during public comment periods, but then if you're saying that, like, um, um, that but just, if, right, it's I, like you're encouraging un, dis, uncivility. Yeah. Incivility. <laughs> Incivility, yes. <laughs> like just be as mean as you want. Yeah. I think because I added that 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 piece about if a council feels this rule has been violated, I, I feel like this belongs in the council counselor conduct section, not in the general you know rules for conduct. Um, the, at least that's how I interpreted yeah. it. That it was referring to how councils. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. I think if this. Is I'm also looking at a hard copy that doesn't have all of this. Yeah, you know, I got to start looking at the screen. I think Athena, I heard Athena's voice. I might be wrong. But no, right. if, I'm if, sorry, six, if six one is renamed so that it, it applies to panelists only, then then this part wouldn't need to exclude public comment period because it only this rule only applies to panelists, right? Council, I mean, it, that's the question. Do we want a public, we can't call it civility, right? When we get to 6.2, the, the general public comment section or, or public in the audience, the audience side mm -hmm. and the participant side, except during general public comment. So mm -hmm. panelists, when we ask Paul for his opinion, when Dave Zomet comes or Guilford comes, they have to follow it too, mm -hmm. but there's the, and then there's the audience sitting there watching what is their behavior while watching. Right. So I think maybe 6.1 and 6.3 can be combined and 6.2 becomes sort of what happens when you're 
watching. So this is this is specific to audience. Yes. Yeah. Well, then, do we need to remove uh, from? Well, we're combining, but uh, six point. All participants, 6.1a, all meeting permit participants, including counselors, residents, and staff. So should we simply take out residents in that sentence? Well, I think that's why I think it just needs someone to, once we've talked yeah. it through, someone just needs to attempt to make it correct. Okay. Uh, Lynn may be leaving. I'm She's muted right now, but she was going to leave about 1015 for another meeting. And Michelle, I know you have a hard stop. Michelle, though, your hand is raised. Yeah, my hard stop is at um, 1045. 1045, yeah. So, yeah. Um, my hand is raised because just, assu just, just assuming, let's say that we adopted some language about um, a point of order if one counselor feels that something another counselor said was outside of the rules or whatever, um, I don't. I would feel uncomfortable or I don't know how that would sort of play out in terms of a staff member. So if we're holding, you know, so if we just went along and said, okay, there was going to be some, something that we could have as counselors as a recourse, if I say something nasty to Pat in a meeting and somebody- Always. <laughs> Um, it's very, it could likely happen though. So, um, I just want to, I just want to say that like if Dave Zomack, um, because he's only the nicest person in the world, but let's say he said something that I felt to be, you know, offensive, I would not want to say point of order, you know, I don't, so mixing them in feels a little bit weird for me. I just see Athena's hand. So I don't, maybe she's a Athena. Thanks, Michelle. In, in my mind, we we don't need to specify that a counselor can call a point of order because that's how a counselor raises an objection because someone's violated the rules. So, you know, any rule that's violated could be raised by a, a point of order and that would um, theoretically apply to any, you know, what, what we're calling uh, panelists in this section. So a counselor could interrupt Dave for being rude and or uh, violating a rule, and then Lynn, as the as the person chairing the meeting, would uh, figure out how to deal with the violation. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. So that can basically come out. I mean, I think that I wrote that in there yeah. before we took that retreat and sort of learned a little bit more about how the rule, like calling a point of order, could really be used for any rule that is out. Um, so mm -hmm. that, that makes sense to me. Thank you, Athena. So ahead, C and D, I think should apply to, at least the cell phones should apply to everyone, whether you're panelists, well, whether you're a participant or audience member. Um, D is a little bit harder with the audience members, but um, you know, private conversations, you know, you could potentially say that are disruptive or something. I don't know. Add because I think disruptive behavior that's the peaceable or you know, whatever that was. Like well, generally speaking, the only times I've ever gotten up to talk to the public during a meeting was on a break. So we're, it, but I think this is referring me talking to um, a resident who, or uh, any partic public participant uh, during a debate, or am I wrong about that? So I've always interpreted D as always violating. When Pat, you and I lean over because you've got a question and I answer it, or I've got a question and you answer it. Um, mm -hmm or um, two members of the public leaning over and carrying on a conversation, um, or a counselor carrying on a conversation with a member of the public mm -hmm. during the meeting. Um, so I've interpreted it all three ways. I think that's why Athena says how to enforce it better. <laughs> but um, well, I would like to at least see the cell phone thing um, kept in there for everyone. Oh, absolutely, yeah. 
I don't know what to do with the private conversations because at least, you know, Pat, you know, when, you know, I've answered questions for Anika or, you know, Jennifer, I think sometimes you lean over, I don't know what you're saying, but sometimes it's what's the motion we're voting on. And instead of right. I, disrupting I, the whole meeting, you can get it answered with just that quick side question. But for me, and uh, Athena, go ahead. I'm sorry, that was residual. Oh, okay. For me, if I lean over and say, uh, Jennifer, what's the vote? What's the vote? And she she goes, she points at it or or says it. It's the it's the no amendment, whatever. That's the end. It's not really a conversation. It's a question. The conversation would be. Uh, hey Jennifer, why are you voting on this? Or hey, did you know that your your husband's ex uh, baseball coach called me and said that he was a great player? I mean, um, that's a conversation, um, and I don't see that. Ha I well, actually, I do see it sometimes. What I notice mostly, which has gotten me incredibly frustrated with our rules and procedures, is most people aren't following them anyway. And I'm not talking about the public; I'm talking about us on so many levels, <laughs> but so, um, uh, I'd like to so, hear from Jennifer and Michelle, yeah. what they think about the private conversation sec, that D. Yeah, and then I wanna go back to uh, B. Go ahead, Michelle. I think it's been interesting because I've participated often at home this year. And so um, I do notice sometimes that something is happening between counselors. Um, and I often, from being at home, I'm wondering if there's something that would have been helpful for me to hear or, you know, so I don't know. I agree with Pat that a conversation is more than just getting a quick question answered for clarification. Um, but I think it can be a slippery slope sometimes, you know, depending on the circumstances. So um, I don't know what you were, Mandy, what you wanted to hear, but uh, in terms of like, are you asking if I agree that that should be in there or? Um, you know, I, I don't, I just wanted to hear what you think, because I don't even know what I think about <laughs> it, right? Like, right. It, it's one of those ones that's like, how do you enforce it and what is it in yeah. some sense, yeah. right? Jennifer? Yeah, I don't, I mean, hmm. you know, usually if, I guess if I turn around and say something, it's maybe something that I thought was funny, but I guess there's really not enough time to ask questions. Although because of where I sit, I will sometimes ask a question of Paul if I don't understand something which maybe I shouldn't do. Also, well, see, what defines private conversation? You know, right. it's not very private, actually, if you're in the middle of a public, you know. And, and then the during council meetings, as Pat said, what about the recesses? What, how does this, you know, like all of it, right? This is why I'm like, I don't know. Um, That's <laughs> I don't think, why don't we leave that one alone? <laughs> um, I, I would say that a recess isn't part of the council meeting because the council meeting has essentially paused. Yeah. Um, but but this language here, disruptive conduct, that could be broad enough to just add into up there everything that applies to panelists too. And that... Mm. And so that would leave a little bit of wiggle room for someone asking the person next to them a question. But if somebody's cell phone is going off repeatedly, then, um, or they were doing something else that was disruptive, then that could be kind of all. So if a conversation was disrupting the meeting, then that would rise to the level of being a violation of the rule. I think that's wise. I think that, what do other people think? I'd like to add that up at the top. Mandy, was that a nod yes or? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 
I think I think in that one we probably have to get rid of disrespectful though potentially. Mm -hmm. Dis and just say or if, it, is, disrespectful maybe for participants is okay, but when we're in the public audience, I don't know. That's I guess if it's, if it's just the audience sitting there and it's not public comment time, yeah, I don't know. Do you mean if someone was in the public in the room making faces at us or something? We right or or that's behavior up. as a put. Well, I don't know. Maybe well, no. Or holding up a sign. We allow. We we say we don't have audible, but we allow signs. What if we just don't like the sign? Oh, yours is disrespectful, but not disruptive. Like I wasn't disrupting. I was just holding up the sign. Mm -hmm. It would um, seem that unless we it was threatening you know, it was harm that you couldn't regulate that sign. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I remember a situation where um, we had a lot of signs in the audience at one point, you know, yep. it, I think it, it was might the have been the educators or something, but, but there was okay. a group that brought a lot of signs in and they were very respectful. They were not disruptive, right? They didn't, the signs did not disrupt the meeting, I, I would argue. Um, but I, I, I point this out because I noticed during the meeting that some of the people um, specifically held their sign to make sure it was seen by the back camera. Like, and so it was kind of like half in the aisle, half not. Um, and it wasn't disruptive of the, audience in the aisle, but I can imagine if someone actually went and got close enough to the camera so that the sign covered the entire eye of the camera, whatever the sign said, so that you could no longer see the meeting, all you could see was the sign, you could potentially argue that that's disruptive. Yeah, well, it um, would be disruptive for right. people. Yeah, and, and I think the solution is simple, which is the person just get, is asked to lower the sign. Yeah. And, I, and they'd only continue to be disruptive if they refuse to do that yeah. or something like that. So I, I feel comfortable making the move that Athena is uh, suggesting. Um, I'd like to go back to 6.1b. Um, maybe, maybe it would be helpful to take anything that applies to public comment from 6.2 and put that into 5.1 and then make this really clear that it's applying to the audience during meetings, not public comment. So you're talking about moving it back to? So I'm saying. Rule five? So, you know, I would. Yeah, public participation. Take, take that out um, and say attend public comments. This, this in my mind doesn't belong here. And then, and, the then, and then maybe, maybe this additional public comment period doesn't ap apply here either. And, and it's just about the con the, um, the conduct of audience members, not pub the public comment period. I think that would clear things up. Yeah. Because then it's the present shall, you know, then you're talking about the present that respects the orderly procedure of the meeting, disruptive conduct, no audible demonstrations, which is audience, right? Mm -hmm. F kind of does both, right? Public comment, but also that's the audience if we're going to continue to allow signs. So this, I like this very much. The council supports the right of the public to express dissent or dissatisfaction with its local government. Uh, and I think it should say a period there or in a peaceable manner. Um, but I think. I wonder, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, I think peaceable manner is good. Let me take out. Civil and respectful. Right. And should 6.2, if we, whether simply say public engagement during meetings? Does that? I would almost say audience expectations during meetings or something like that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, because my screen froze, okay. Behavior, audience behavior sounds so. Yeah, it does. <laughs> you know, like, that's why I didn't use behavior. I was like, oh, I don't like that word. <laughs> me neither. Audience, audience. Uh, conduct. Oh, that could work. Well, we're, yeah, we have, we have counselor. The code of conduct is the rule. Also, why are we taking, why are we exchanging audience for public? To, yeah, I don't to have... differentiate the between pub, the public comment period and what and the audience does. During council discussions and stuff where there's no public comment happening. Oh, okay, but it's still the public that we're referring yes. to. It's yes, yes. Conduct, okay, okay. Yeah, it took me a while too. <laughs> so, I think the very first thing that should be part of this then would be F. Yeah, I agree. That should be at the top. Well, no, it says the council welcomes, welcomes after public a. After, after a. a, yes. Yeah. And then the council supports the right of the public to express dissent or dissatisfaction with its lo local government in a peaceable manner. And then we say, oh, and then maybe so A, then F, then E, then D, then G. <laughs> They can dissent yeah. and disagree, but you still need to conduct in a peaceable manner. Yes, and then we're, what we're and, including is those present shall not engage in audible demonstrations right. of- And then, but you can re video record. If you have permission. Yeah. I, yeah. I can go with that. How are other people with that? Is this the right, is this the right order that you said? Um, A. We'd be getting rid of, D, well, D would be moving, right? Yeah. Or is D staying? I think D is moving to the public comment side. Okay. But I... <laughs> I don't think it has to. I think it's okay there. Think, yeah. That that sort of says it keeps it within, you know, we're talking mm -hmm. about the full audience, but we're also saying here that um that the public will have a chance to participate during public comment. I think I don't know. I think it's clear clear to have it here. Um, then I would put that one as the generally one as the second one on the list. Personally. Wait, wait. Where, where, Amanda, you're so saying- So after A, after welcomes the public it, to the meetings, then they generally only yeah. participate during- public. Ah, yes, yes. And okay. then just centered dissatisfaction. And then- No was, audible and then respectful. I feel like respectful makes sense before audible. The, the disruptive conduct makes sense before audible. Uh, okay. Can you say disrupt- dis well, that's what we'll, we'll look at that. Yeah. yeah. I, I think we actually have to delete the word disrespectful or I think it just says if disruptive conduct, disruptive conduct. Yeah. I think yeah. is what because we Because here do. that you respect the orderly procedure of the meeting. You're not screaming public comment in the middle of, of a vote. You're being recognized. Yeah. I also think that it's confusing to have C here and not in the public comment 
portion. Um, because I might read this and think that you're saying I have the right to express dissent and dissatisfaction outside of the public comment period. And if that's not what we're saying, um, because I might interpret mm. that in, you know, like I might interpret that, that I'm in the audience, it's not a public comment period. And you've told me I have the right to express my dissent. And this is how I do that. Okay. I, I hear what you're saying. I wonder if this shouldn't say that council supports the right of the public to express their scent or dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction, blah, blah, uh, during uh, the public comment period or. Or what if right. I just add this to see? E either to say in a peaceful manner during the public comment period um or it could be added to b i think i think the dissent or dissatisfaction can go in both the public comment period but also this one if maybe we add to the end of this one through non-audible means or something mm, no no you, you know like like so, how, how do we indicate that signs are okay well yeah. can we just add this can we just add this to present um to see and or what to see i'm sorry those, I... those present shall not engage in audible demonstrations of approval disapproval the council supports the right of the uh, i think I we should just say what we mean which is signs are allowed <laughs> like you know, if it's signs that we're talking about, let's just be really clear that, you know. Could you say signs are allowed, but no, what is it? Audible, audible right, right. means of disruption. If it's local government in a peaceable manner. So we could say something like those present shall not engage in audible demonstrations of approval or disapproval. Um, that other the approval or just audible demonstrations, how you know semicolon, however written or signs are permissible or something. But or, maybe we want to get rid of. What about while, while signs are permitted, those presents shall not engage in audible demonstrations. I like that, Pat. That's, That's what good. I'm yeah. But I still think we should clarify and see that we're, I mean, is there other ways then that an audience member that's not in public comment period could express dissent or dissatisfaction in a peaceable manner that we would not approve of? Well, they shouldn't say anything out loud. I mean, like how, if you're saying that I have the right to express dissent or dissatisfaction, what might I do to express that, that we would not? The, I guess if people started cheering time. from the audience. Well, it, so that happens That says, you know, whatever the, the Southboro case, had signs that you know I'm not I think it was signs plus words right but yeah. a sign could say something like you all voted wrong you know or even yeah. harder you know? yeah. <laughs> but, right. but you couldn't have people who were sitting in town hall chanting during the meeting right. can I can I say some, the council supports the right C as it is um and then those uh where is it While it's signs not. are permitted, just adding that up there, while signs are permitted, those presents shall not engage in audible demonstrations of approval or disapproval or coming right after C. I mean, it clarifies for, I think. I would get rid of everything after the word demonstrations, the approval or disapproval, because, because it's also, you can have signs that aren't approval or disapproval. 
right? Just ex yeah, expressing just audible demonstrations. A sign can express a desire before we mm -hmm. vote it. That's not necessarily. Oh approval. yes, yes, yeah. Now, looking at E and thinking about the SJC decision, can a recess be called? Yes. If, yeah. And I believe Lauren said, yeah, or we could adjourn the meeting. Those are two things that the selectman did, but he did it in, op yeah, in a very different you, way. And you can always call a recess to try and get control of a meeting. Yeah, okay. Okay. So that should be E as it is, right? Yeah. So are people okay with this section? Oh, we need to look at F. There were no recommended changes to that one. Yeah. That's the recording one. Right. Can we go back up to the first part? Did we make all the changes in 6.1 that we were talking about? I don't think we made the changes. Yeah, that's what. I think we just talked about stuff. Because the question is, how does 6.1 relate to 6.2 and 6.3? Uh, this is specific to panelists. I, you know, but some of it is specific, like cell phones, yeah. right? Like, yeah. I think I think originally six point one was supposed to be everyone. Six point two was right, just it is. the public, and six point three was like counselor. Yeah, and I think that that's it's still important that invited speakers and presenters and guests and council members uh, that we're trying to. That's what we're trying to address that we want an atmosphere, a peaceable atmosphere. But the the sticky part is that it doesn't include the public comment period because you can be insulting during a public comment period. <laughs> well, we're getting rid of civility. Well, um, well, this is where I wonder if 6.1 just gets folded into or you just keep the cell phones um, and the private conversation ones, or just repeat them into 6.2 and 3, and you fold 6.1 into 6.3 and make it counselor and invited speakers, presenters, and guests. But you fold cell phones and all into both of those. Um, I think we had roll into 6.1. So, so we roll stick three into six one. Right. But we also don't want the public using their cell phones and stuff. So we can just add that one to six two too. Just repeat a couple things. Um, so have it in both places? Yeah. But see, the point of 6.1 is said, hey, wait, this part of it applies to everybody whether you're uh, uh, the public, whether you're staff, whether you're counselors. And, and that's why I like invited speakers, presenters, guests. It's, you know, we're saying you can't use insulting, threatening, or abusive language during public debate, except we you can insult people during public debate. It's, <laughs> during public right. comment. During yeah. public comment. That's why mm -hmm. I think that 6.1 and 6.3 need combined. And yeah. then whatever that cell phone thing and maybe the private conversation thing need to just be repeated in 6.2 somewhere. I don't, I'm, I'm stuck here, but I'm willing to move things around if that's the, um, consensus of the rest of you. And has Michelle gone? I think she no. has. Okay, and I don't believe Lynn is actually here. 
Seems I mean, I'm I'm willing to take a stab at combining one and three. If I get Athena's sheet here. <laughs> yeah, I'll share it. Um, yeah. Yeah, and Athena, can you make sure I get a copy of this sheet too? And then maybe I could. Um, no, you have to take your own notes. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'll send it. I'll send it around. Thank you. We still have a quorum. So we I can... mean, I guess the question is looking at number three, 6.3. Mm -hmm. Half of that is about three minutes, no more than once beforehand. Yeah, and so. If someone like Dave, like, how do you do that with with a invited staff member? I know that's. None of these rules are followed anyway, but anyhow. Um, so maybe. Did we maybe just add in the four times? That's a that's a request. Wait, 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 let me hear what Athena was going to say. So and maybe, then Jennifer, ask your question. Um, so maybe there's a differentiation between counselors and those invited to present. Um, Are those panelists? In Zoom, everyone's a panelist. But yeah, it, yeah. We invited Mindy Dom and Joe Comerford to come and speak to us. Um, Lauren uh, or other people from KP Law come and present issues to us. We invite guests to speak. Uh, Sometimes we have joint meetings with other committees yeah. and all. So maybe six point one is invited speakers, presenters, and guests, and six point three stays counselors. Yeah. And 6.2 is the public. Yeah. So we don't combine this with 6.3. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Although I think we'll end up repeating some. Yeah. Things, but we could, I could at least take a stab at something. That would be wonderful, Mandy. And also, I don't know, since we're really trying to clarify these different roles and the behavior in these roles, it seems to me repeating something we're showing that we're not treating the public differently than we treat invited guests or we treat ourselves in a certain kind of way. This. Jennifer? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, I, I agree. I didn't know if you thought I had my hand up. Uh, but yeah, and then if in in six point one, it could simply can you back down? So, so we're so we're uh, not rolling into six point one, correct? We're not rolling six point one into six point three. No. Yeah, okay. we're gonna keep it sort of like its own little, but um. Uh, so it, I think you can get rid of in a six point one a. Um, including counselors, residents, and staff. It's like all meeting participants shall focus their remarks on the matter being discussed or voted on. So maybe we re remove, oh. See, I yeah, think it, if we just define meeting participants as those invited speakers, presenters, guests, and counselors, except during the general public comment period or something like, I don't know. We have to play with it. <laughs> yeah. Because again, the general public comment period, you can kind of you can comment on anything. Yes. Uh, it, within the purview of the council, we've kept right. It. I mean, if you want to start talking about banners, you could, you know. You could, because it's yeah. on yeah. Or it but is. if you wanted to uh talk about uh, I don't know what. So I, I don't think you could talk about you know, something something that um, I would argue is not within the purview of the council is the performance of a, a an employee that is not the town manager or the town clerk because those are the only two we have any jurisdiction over on hiring not the lifeguard at the pool. Right. Right. 
And if and if, a, if someone from the public wants to address that issue, they should be contacting the town manager directly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Is there? Shall we move on? Um, yeah, I'll try to take a stab at this. I don't know how well I'll do. <laughs> Knowing you, it'll be great. Yeah. What we're really saying to the public between the two of you, it'll be magnificent. I need a hair something. Jennifer, you were saying something. No, so we're really just saying in terms of public comment, as long as it's peaceable and within the um, jurisdiction of the council, people can pretty much say what they want. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to add those into that public comment section on five while I'm making taking a stab at all of this? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, what was the change on five? Um, we're going to, the things you had highlighted regarding moving from 6.2, I will, in whatever draft I, as I work through the, what we talked about, I'll put into the per correct spot in five. Oh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Mandy. Do we want to wrestle with counselors' comments? Conduct, rather. Of the potential changes that were already asked? Uh, I guess we're all right. I have in here L because we had a, a counselor when initially when we were asking for counselor input, they wanted to have an L in this section, stand up for staff. Um, I don't particularly agree with that. I don't see the point of it, but I do did want to bring it up because the counselor brought it up. You mean if somebody were to say something not complimentary to a staff, we could defend the staff? Yeah. I think we that's what we're specifically not allowed to do under this yeah. court case. Well, yeah. no, and during public comment, but yeah. So, so Jennifer, do you, Athena's gonna put it up. Yeah. See that? I don't think we can do. I don't think the second sentence we can do anymore. Right. The first one says should. And so I think KP law indicated we could have aspirations, but, mm -hmm, but not. We, don't. <laughs> we can't do anything about it. So I don't know. So I don't think the first that first sentence violates Southboro. Number, I, I would like to get rid of stand up for staff. Members of the public shall focus on policy, not people when debating. I agree. Issues. I think the stand up for the staff we can't do. Yeah. So so this is under counselor's conduct. Right. Uh, and so I think the if we split this into two, if we want to say under public comment. The council requests members of the public focus on policy, not people, when making public comments. Yeah. And, and then, under, go ahead. Un, under whatever five is, and then here would be counselors should focus on policy, not people, when debating issues. You can yeah. add that one in. Although I, yeah, no, 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 I was wrong. I spoke too early. Why were you wrong? I was going to say, I thought the focus on policy was already in 6.3, but it's not. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm glad I brought this up then. So C, Jennifer, uh, 6.3C, I had made a requested change. I. I don't know what I think about it, but um, where are you? Yeah, I got to see it. Six point three. It's about maximum numbers of times to speak. Um, Is that in our? No, it's a suggestion. 
So I, yeah, I don't necessarily. Uh, So yeah. um, it was, let, let me just say, it was a thought, and I, like I said, I don't know what I actually think of it anymore. I've noticed sometimes that, and it's different counselors, different times, that a lot of times our discussions end up with three, two or three counselors, sometimes just going back and forth. Um, sometimes redundant, sometimes not. Um, and so this was a random thought of what do we do? I don't necessarily think this is the right solution, but that was sort of what I was thinking. Like if if we don't, fr frankly, we don't follow C anyway all the time, making no, we sure don't. that non-speakers get to be recognized um, before someone's spoken more than well, one. But I think that there's a real attempt to... Go ahead, Jennifer. And that's fine. No, no. no I, I think that Lynn, I think Lynn does that usually it. happens. Lynn, you know, yeah. lets people speak once before someone speaks twice. I mean, the reason I, I would I would not be think there's like the addition of no more than four times. Because again, I think the presiding officer can use a lot of discretion, but since we can't really talk out of a public meeting, that's the only time we have. Yeah. And the, yeah. I mean, I've we've all sat through some that are tiring in a certain kind of way, but I I, th I do think that Jennifer's right that I, I and I don't feel comfortable with this. First, okay. we can we can ignore it and reject it. That's fine. Lynn, do you have anything you want to add? Since um, you <laughs> sorry, uh, first of all, uh, if anybody wants to keep count, fine. But I. I agree that we should just ignore it. I'm not going to sit there with a, th a thing that says stroke one, stroke two, <laughs> or you're out. Okay. Yeah. I And I think that you have intervened when two counselors are going at it and it's not really furthering anything. I think the big issue that I notice, and this, you know, is a little bit like what Mandy Joe's noticing, but it's, we've gotten to the point that it's clear people have made up their mind. And we just need to call the question or agree that we're ready to go to the vote. That's all. Yeah, and I think that's important. Um, I, I, you know, a lot is on you for consistency and having the clock up for residents and counselors has, I think, has been helpful. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I, I will say that we need to just make sure we continue to use it. I know when, now that we have somebody who is, I hope we still have somebody who's working with Athena during council meetings, um, but she wasn't there the other night. So I don't know where we stand on that. Oh, Kel she was just out of town. She's out of town um, okay. until uh, after I, the first. But yeah, and I think when she here. when she's there, it helps a lot. Yeah. I, I uh, also ask Lynn to to tell me when to use the clock because sometimes it's you know where people are asking questions and then it starts to wander into debate. So it's really helpful Lynn when you say let's go ahead and use the clock so it doesn't feel like somebody's being singled out. Yeah, and I hear that Athena, but it seems to me it, it should always be used. Uh, and then there's then that's such a consistency. We all you know it's tr like training your puppy. Um, we all get used to I have three minutes unless I'm presenting something. Um, I, I think it should be there for counselors. It should be there for the public at all times. That's my personal opinion. So deciding when to use it feels like an inconsistency. And nobody has to agree with me. That's fine. <laughs> I, I, I think that's that's part of the, the difficulty, right? Um, I, I would agree, Pat. It should probably be used all times. But then if a staff member or the sponsor or a committee chair is or a committee members trying to answer a question, are they held to the three minutes too? Right. Like yeah, and maybe answering we a question the rules. Answering a question feels different. Yeah. You know, it's I'm, we're talking now about um uh, setting a time limit of three minutes, three to one minutes, according to our rule, depending on the number of people. 
uh, being clocked. So that helps the presenter, the public person, and it helps the counselors. But uh, I too many times the things, and it can be stopped if, if Dave Zomack is going to be answering a question and he takes four minutes. I don't, it doesn't feel like the same thing. It, it's not a lack of consistency for that. So, and, so I need to differentiate between when a sponsor is answering a question and when they're speaking in support of their thing, because sometimes that line mm -hmm. is very blurry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I can use it. So this is a counselors only at this point the three minutes, not staff. Right, but office. but if there's a council yeah. sponsor of something. Yeah. So maybe maybe that's maybe that's the first part of the, the debate is ask questions and then we're gonna debate the thing. Then that's a distinguish that uh, a line that it's a little clearer for me, but similar to public hearings. Isn't when a presenter they're given initial they they have more time or presenters a combination yeah. they have more time wouldn't it be similar when they were answering a question about the proposal or the policy that they were presenting so do we do we want to adhere strictly to this they're going to present their thing and then any questions and stuff after that is three minutes I, I was actually going to say, once the question's asked, don't we want to encourage brevity in answering? <laughs> Maybe we do, right? Like, which, which actually goes to three minutes, except when introducing or presenting a measure. Do we actually want to put a time limit on introducing and pre presentations of measures? Not just for counselors, but for staff members, too. Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> like, whenever something comes back. Do we want a five minute? Yeah. You know, do we want something? I don't. I don't know. But you know, we don't have any limit. Lynn's the one that tries to, I think, rein presenters in by talking to them before the meetings and saying, "You get this." But hmm. and then it's good luck with that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, and it's that's absolutely right. I mean, I, um, I, you know, Athena, we can talk about this, but I'm actually beginning to feel like we should just always be using the clock, except when it's presenters and, you know, questions. And even if it is, the clock up there just reminds people of a need for brevity. And it's you only know, if it's ticking does it do that. If it's well, that's that's the issue. <laughs> is is have it be ticking because um, when it's ticking, it starts, it makes people aware of it. Yeah. Uh, I, I particularly, think, I don't think, I think the only people that might not be able to see it is if they're on certain phones. Yeah. But that's that otherwise, sense. I think anybody can see it, whether they're in Zoom or whatever. You did something with Vince O'Connor, which I totally supported because he answered a question. And yes. then he made his statement and you were very clear about that, that this is why I ran it over. Yeah. Uh, and, and I totally supported that and appreciated the clarity. Yeah, I felt in that case, you know, I mean, Vince does have a history, uh, a knowledge of history in Amherst that sometimes yeah. is just, uh, Beats even Mandy Joe. By far. <laughs> I, I, think around around like, I don't know. Here longer than Mandy's been alive. alive. <laughs> <laughs> and he was probably in town yeah. meeting that whole time. <laughs> uh, are we? Oh, my dog is dreaming, so she's in the background. Going, <laughs> <laughs> um, are we done right now with this section? Is there anything else before we move? to snow and ice. Okay. Love awesome. it. We've gone from flags to conduct to snow and ice. Hey, you know. <laughs> snow and ice and brush. Excuse <laughs> and me, I forgot the brush. <laughs> Jennifer? 
Yeah, so actually somebody pointed out, and I think when I look at this, are we now not- um, You can't hear me? No, we can. Oh, okay. What are you on? Oh, snow and ice. I just wanted to ask- okay. <laughs> No, are we now calling it, which I think is good, obstruction of public ways, penalties for the violation of obstruction? Are we not calling it snow and ice, but obstruction, obstruction of public ways? Pat, was Pat you're muted. That, that is the plan. I think someone asked, maybe we could say obstruction of public ways and snow and ice removal or something. I, I think it would be good to have snow and ice in the title for search purposes, if nothing else. You're right, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, I agree. So snow I just, and ice and obstruction. Yeah, I just use the shorthand for us of snow and ice. So, yeah. and because okay. we haven't officially changed the name, it has to be voted on. But, right. yeah. So, obstruction of public ways and snow and ice removal. Yeah. Can you put it up, Athena? Yeah, I'm looking for the, the right document. Okay, here we go. Where's my snow and ice? Oops. Thank you. Uh, so what change did you want to the, you wanted snow, ice, and obstruction? Hmm. So I, I was doing it as obstruction of public ways and snow and ice removal. I think that's better. I agree. <laughs> and is it a change in this, which I think is good that we're saying the owner of real property, so it's not just residential, but applies to commercial ownership as well? Yes. No. Now, in the packet, there are comments from the tree warden um, and also uh, including adding tot toters to um, things that can obstruct the sidewalk or driveways. But before we do that, um, I'd like us to think about the enforcement. Paul was, I thought, very clear about why the enforcement should remain in the police department with the traffic the parking officers or the traffic officers being the people who contact and who uh, residents and can uh, give out uh, citations. Um, so I, I, and then the, what I remember that the comment was, well, somebody calls uh, DPW and they say to go to the police and then the police tell them to go to the DPW. So what we, I feel like is we need to really clarify the process with both DPW and the police department. And it could be that the a resident complains to the DPW and it's the DPW that contacts the police department, but that might be uh, wonky. But so somebody doesn't go in a circle. Um, and I don't know whether uh, there was agreement about following Paul's recommendation. Um, it's Given that we're hoping there's going to be more inspections happening, um, do we really want the building inspector inspection, inspectional services um, out there doing this for us? And you know, we it's like when you get a ticket for parking, it happens kind of immediately after you've over the limit in a, in a certain way, or if you get a parking ticket for doing something inappropriate on the street, you get the ticket right away. And it feels like that would be a reasonable response to uh, me calling, except I'd go talk to my neighbor, but calling and saying, uh, they haven't cleared the snow and ice, I can't get into whatever. Uh, Jennifer? Yeah, but wasn't there a concern about, you know, um, if enforcement was really happening? Um, well, there's been a lot, uh, and Lynn, you probably know this much better than I do, but there's been a lot of times where DPW, there's been complaints and it doesn't change, so they go and clear it. 
So if you know that's going to happen, then why do you clear it? Um, and so I think that there's some learned behaviors by residents and staff that have created a problem. Mm -hmm. my, my sense is two things. First of all, if the complaint goes to DPW, don't give the resident a runaround. Have DPW call the police. Yeah. Giving residents runarounds is one of the ways that we really annoy our residents. Yep. Second of all, I really believe that they can do warnings and then they need to ticket, but it needs to be a way in which the ticket then goes to the owner of the property, unless it's written into the lease of the property that the, the person who is inhabiting the property is supposed to take care of that. And you know that's a nuance we may not be aware of one way or the other, but it, having this, uh, the issue of absentee landlords who frankly don't even know it snowed in Amherst. Um, but, and then, you know, the ticket goes and it just sits there. And at some point that ticket needs to be resolved and it needs to be resolved with the person who owns the property unless yeah. otherwise stated in a lease. Yeah, and but finding out that whether it's stated in the lease seems problematic. There's a student house on the corner uh, behind me and they always have someone clearing snow and they always have someone mowing the lawns, et cetera. Where my resident neighbor who lives on the other corner blocks the line of sight because they often don't mow their lawn, at least in the front. So when you come out, you really can't see, you have to get out too far to see. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know how you would uh, deal with the who own, who's responsible beyond the landlord, and they would maybe have more effect anyway. I'm not sure. Mandy and then Athena. Athena can go first. Okay. Um, it 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 makes sense to me to clarify that this is police officers if DPW isn't going to come and clear it on private property, if it doesn't make sense for anybody to call DPW and then DPW to call the police. You know, I mean, it, it makes sense to me to just make it really clear that if someone is complaining about an obstruction that they can call the police to come and give a warning because Paul's memo said that right. um, the parking enforcement officers would come and do that. So it seems like it doesn't belong in DPW on private property anyway. And then the other issue with um, the, between renters and, and landlords and so on, seems like it belongs with the property owner to then resolve with their tenant and not for the council to or for the town to determine who's responsible yeah. in the lease because we don't have yeah. access to people's right. leases. So. Right. If it's in the lease, they'll deal with the tenant. Then the, they'll right, just call and say, hey. Property owner would. Yeah. Mandy, thank you, Athena. So, I mean, it sounds like part of the problem is the police officers never even go out and check when they get called. So it's not even that they're not writing tickets. They don't even go inspect. How do right you know? Now. Because they send you to DPW and DPW sends you back. And 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 so so another my my own experience when I've done this. Uh in prior locations, I've gone to, I've literally walked into the police department and said, I'm complaining about snow obstructions here. A week goes by and nothing is done. And the only assumption I can make from that, given the current bylaw, is that the owner was never even contacted, right? Because there's no clearing and the current bylaw even says, we can do it for them and then charge them to do it. And so I guess part of the question is how do we get someone to actually write that warning or that ticket? Or and, that or simply make the phone call. Or or you know when when a phone call is made whether it be to DBW or whoever we designate how do we actually get the traffic enforcement officer that Paul says he wants to actually go out and do something. <laughs> We're just the legislative body. I don't know 
how we say, it, you know, if they don't believe it's their job, they don't, they just ignore it, right? They say, oh, no, that's DPW, they'll fix it. I, so I don't know what that solution is other than to include everyone and say, everyone, hey, start writing tickets. You know, if it's the building commissioner that's out there, if it's Alan Snow, our tree warden that's out there, I, I, I don't know what the solution is. It seems like a small it. question. Yeah. Because if the police do not have the capacity to do this, it's not. Right. Or if they just don't want to, I mean, it might right. not even be capacity. I don't know. They might just feel like that's not what their job is, no matter what we wrote in a bylaw. Paul is saying it's their responsibility. And so I would suggest bringing that up with Paul that. Right. I mean, does it really happen? I guess part of the. Yeah. Yeah, I think I would like to take that route. We're addressing it directly with Paul first. And I can do that. You know, you want this, but this is a residence experience over and over again. How do we clarify? How do we make sure that this is going to happen? That the resident is contacted uh, either with a warning or a fine, you know. So, Mandy, your hand's still up. No, my hand is still up. So, if we don't want DPW doing the actual clearing, the question is, do we keep D in section D? The remedies of um, after due notice perform cause the clearing to be performed and then recover expenses if we're basically just going to find a way until they do it do we keep d at all um and if we're going to find a way the next question i have is up in the data block that doesn't look like a data block here the non-criminal disposition we just have 50 dollars per 24 hour period um we have many general bylaws that have a first offense, second offense, third offense, where the first one's a warning, the second one is like a $50 fine, the third one is a $100 fine, X, Y, Z. Do we want to actually create the step sort of system within the penalty block up above on that? Uh, Jennifer and then Lynn. But the thing is our goal is to have the obstruction cleared, not just to fine. So that's really, like I know the Disability Access Committee, that's, they want it fixed. Yeah. So that's why I'm comfortable, you know, just to say we're going to find a way that that doesn't solve the obstruction issue. Nor the repeating of the obstruction issue. Lynn? Oh. First of all, I know that we have he been hesitant in the past to put fines in bylaws, but rather to put them in regulations uh, so that we don't have to open up a bylaw when we, when we need to change it. I just raised that. This may be one of those exceptions where we don't care. The other thing, though, that I, I, I absolutely agree, the goal is to get it cleared. I want to make sure the D doesn't open the town up for liability if we don't clear it. Mm. In fact, the whole bylaw, because what if we don't clear it and then someone falls and our bylaw says after such a point in time, we cleared it, but we charged. I think we're now liable. Or if we cleared it under this following all the rules and then someone fell. Yeah. So uh, uh, in that regard, let's make sure um, what we have. A law review? Yeah. And, and then, so I have one final question, which is Alan Snow's comments about public shade trees contact the tree warden for evaluation. Should we be reconfiguring B2 to do his sort of two things, his two comments. Mm. He had two categories and they're sort right. of all one category. Should we just reconfigure B for the two categories? I don't know. 
or we might be able to just say, I, I don't know, we'd have to figure out the wording, but. Well, his other reason for maintaining it in the police department was to maintain quality accounting and a fiduciary control in one department. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I got distracted. So can, can you pose your question again, Mandy? It, it was about Alan Snow's thing about brushy oh. growth. Um, those that are private trees versus those that are public shade trees. Right. And the shade trees need to, like he, he recommended that if they're shade, public shade trees, that the, the first thing that be done is not the fine, that it be contact him, mm -hmm. um, the tree warden for evaluation. And he said it normally takes him two to three business days. So do we need a something in here about you know, I had for the purposes of this bylaw vegetative overgrowth up to seven feet above the surface shall be considered obstruction. We could add a sentence that said, um, if that overgrowth is from a public shade tree. Yes, I think that's a good idea because um, it really the does want to have- shall be contacted for evaluation before anything is done or before, before a violation is issued or something. I don't know what the right language is. I'm not sure if it's violation because if it's a pub, if it's our tree, if it's a town tree. The town um, can, in theory, the town can violate this bylaw if it's got private, you know, on my neighborhood where there's a ton of trees next to the sidewalk that's on town land. It's not public shade trees necessarily, mm -hmm. and they might block. Mm hmm. Well, I know that he was very concerned that people, uh, residents could use it because they wanted the tree to stop blocking their living room window mm -hmm. and not have anything to do really with the street. And then they would do it and say, oh, but it was, you know, so he was concerned. He wants to be able to view that. And I, I support that. Um, and I, you know, it, one of the things that he mentioned is should we be defining obstruction really clearly because it can be signs it can be and he's suggesting trash totes toters and i think that's a good idea uh plantings brush snow and um, and he actually suggested everything through c click fix which is dpw yeah that's true. not police right <laughs> again like who, <laughs> who goes to enforcement and and i see he suggested 10 days or so to correct some of the issues, two to three to 10 days. So we need to look at our 24 hours issue mm -hmm. or brush. And then the issue with like the toters, I mean, that's a real education. We would have to get word out to people. Yeah, that they're required yeah. to bring, you know, not bring them in like my neighbors, Toters are outside right now. They're at the end of her driveway, but I, cars can get by. But sometimes the wind knocks them over once they're empty and things like that. It's a little. So my husband puts the toters out two days before. It drives me crazy. So now I have a way to tell him I'd love to say it's not allowed. <laughs> well, you can make up a law anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read Alan's toter thing is more of if a snowstorm is coming and the toters sit out there our sidewalk plows, right? them, the areas well. where, where sidewalk plowing can't get plowed. And so the question becomes, should we be sidewalk plowing private properties? <laughs> We've no. had that conversation, right? Um, no, but if, they, if the toters are in the street, that's his. Mm, for the general plow too. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, it is 1124 um, and um, I'd like to bring this back. I'd like to uh, talk to uh, Paul directly, which I will do if the committee agrees about uh, enforcement and the issues that are being raised about why can't there be this dual enforcement between uh, police department and DPW with clear lines about what happens when and who does it. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, and I'd like to, uh, We, I believe there's just one person in public, 
attending. And if uh, so, I'd like to open it for public comment and then move to uh, vote on the minutes from the last meeting and to end on time. Does that feel comfortable to people? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, with it, Snow and Ice will be back with us at our next meeting. I don't, uh, obstructions of sidewalks and snow and ice. Certainly yeah. hope Snow and Ice is not back with us at our next meeting. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> It'll okay. be are we in public okay. comment, Pat? Yeah, pardon me? Are we in public comment? Not yet. I'm oh. going to officially open the public comment period. So if uh, an attendee would like to speak, they could raise their hand and let us know. And please come into the room and bring her in. And will you state your name and where you live? Hi, I'm Anita Saro. I'm in District 5. Um, First, um, you have a thankless task, all of you, and you're doing an amazing job. I've uh, written many a bylaw and rule myself, and I know the difficulty of saying too much, saying too little, and being misinterpreted. Um, one of the things that struck me in the discussion, and particularly around the um, the issue of uh, counselor conduct. I, I think sometimes with rules, they're drafted in terms of prohibitions, which leads to Athena's good question of enforcement. How, uh, but sometimes rules can also be, I don't know even if it's expectational. I, and it, because in terms of, of counselors, the expectation is that all counselors will be attendant at every meeting and fully participate and fully listen. And if there are questions, even if it's just, where are we? That might be questions that shared with others. I know it happens a lot in boards that I chair um, to try to look at particularly in that section around uh, code of conduct, to, it's just a thought process more than anything to think about what, what the reasonable expectations are and mm -hmm. maybe even state them. Uh, just a couple of other things. Um, I'm, I'm finally paying attention to, to these rules. And I had, have, I, I guess it's a question. Um, about, and you don't have to answer it now or, or ever, but um, about um, uh, public dialogue and when that's appropriate to use. And because that seems like a really good tool for getting um, good public engagement and, and good dialogue. Um, the other thing I was thinking of while you're on five is the district meetings and um, do both district um, counselors have to be present at all meetings? You know, what if one is called and one can't make it? It's unclear in, in the rule about whether it requires the two or could it be just one if the meeting is recorded and, and the absent uh, district counselor would have the benefit of that raw data? from mm -hmm. people who are uh, living there. And finally, I noticed that you folks are, are paying attention to abstentions and it's always been something of a bugaboo for me. Um, it, you know, how, how they are sometimes misused and, and the fact that they do fundamentally change the vote. So I, I urge, urge you all to uh, continue you know, that conversation, um, you know, with Athena and others about the appropriate use uh, and the impact of abstentions, because it could be profound. So yeah. thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you, Anita. Okay, then what I'd like to do is make a motion that we accept the February, uh, why do I do that? The April 12th meeting minutes uh, as uh, presented. Is there a second? I can't second my own motion. So. I'll second it. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> is there any debate or I was um, trying to give someone else the opportunity I know I, <laughs> I my problem is I wasn't there for the whole meeting so I didn't want to second it yeah. uh, you know from, okay. I can still vote but right. that's okay. I, yes. I can still vote you can vote whether you were there or not yeah, yeah. okay uh, I'm going to assume that everybody is uh, going to vote right now. Mandy? Aye. Lynn? Aye. Jennifer? Aye. And it's an aye from me, so the vote is unanimous to accept the minutes as presented with one absent. All right. I am going to adjourn this meeting, if that's okay with everybody. Very productive. <laughs> good. Yeah, good meeting. Yeah. yeah. Thanks uh, for your okay, work. Thank you. Yeah. Good meeting. Thanks.